Hey there, everybody. It's Christopher with Midbay News. Um, we are in uh, the beginning of election season, and to celebrate the uh, the reason for the season, we're going to be talking to local candidates for the two big races that are local here in Okaloosa County that are going to take place in August. So that's the school board race, District 2, and Okaloosa County Commission race, District 3. Those are both in the primary vote that's going to take place in August. And with me today, I have Parker Destin, who is one of the candidates running for school board District 2. And so, Parker, if you would, without any further ado, uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Uh, my name is Parker Destin. I am a lifelong resident of Destin, Florida, Okaloosa County, born and raised. I went to uh, school from uh kindergarten through 12th grade here graduate of fort walton beach high school uh i left and went to school got an undergraduate degree at the university of tampa in business then uh i got lost along the way and became a lawyer uh thereafter and practiced for about six years came home and and practiced for a while and then had an opportunity to get back into the restaurant business i never really left the restaurant business but i'm back in it uh starting around 2018 we opened up another location to Dewey's over in Navarre, Florida, and along with my food truck, my wife and I started uh, another business, uh, Pink Coyote Ice Cream Dessert Company, and that's been doing really well. We've been uh, working on that for the last several years. The brick and mortar location of that one's going to open up in Fort Walton probably uh, middle of summer this year, you know, knock on wood. And <clears throat> I'm a former uh, member of the Destin City Council. I served for four years from about 2016 to 2020. We that was a great experience. It was a all volunteer gig, but we righted the ship on overgrowth and development in Destin. You know, we had 20 straight years of just probably proven more stuff than we really could handle in Destin. It was time for a change. And me and a young co cohort of other folks got on council and we slowed things down to a more responsible uh, pace of growth and development that has put us on a better trajectory moving forward so that we don't choke on our own success, so to speak. And those debates are happening all over the county right now, as you know. I'm sure you guys are covering some of the, the discussions that are happening in the North End. Um, I've been on a bunch of appointed boards. Uh, I most recently have served uh, the Senate president as, as one of uh, her members on the Florida Historical Commission. Um, I would suggest that personally I am passionate about collecting Florida history and cataloging it. My wife might characterize it as obsessive, but she's really understanding. And so, I mean, serving on that board has been the most fun I've been able to have in government. My mother's a lifelong um, educator. She served in the district for 33 years as a first grade teacher. My dad served on school board uh, in, uh, I want to say about 2012 to 2020. So that was a little bit several years ago. And so in that regard, I would say, you know, education is in my blood. I care deeply about what happens in our community. I have previously served in some of the municipal capacities and some of the state appointed roles. And I have come back consistently to being worried and concerned about uh, whether or not we're really educating children, whether we're getting distracted by a bunch of political noise on on whether we're really moving the ball forward, the needle forward in Okaloosa County on education. You know, we're doing really well. I'm not saying that to say, oh, our hair's on fire in Okaloosa County uh, schools, because we really do have a great school system. You can, and it doesn't take very, you know, go to your left, go to your right, east, west. You know, things are not as good in Okaloosa as it is in Okaloosa County. So... <clears throat> But we could do better. There's always room to improve. We're number, we're in the top 10% uh, from an academic standpoint out of 67 Florida counties, but we're dead last in one category, and that's the average age of our infrastructure. Now, the half cent sales tax has gone a long way to improve that, and we're going to continue to support that and move the, move the ball forward. But I'd like to see us make some headway on catching up on 30 years worth of deferred maintenance. I want to make sure that we make the investments in the north end that are going to that are already necessary, but are going to be even more so as the North End continues to grow, because that's where all the available land is going to be. And as soon as you develop it, you build a home, you sell it, those kids are going to, that family's going to come in and enroll those kids in the district uh, shortly thereafter. So we need to be ready for all of that. And I can't tell you uh, how excited I am to run. Uh, the, the response so far has been really, really great. I'm, I'm a pretty moderate, reasonable guy, I'd like to think. Uh, so I have some some curb appeal to a lot of folks, but I'm a businessman first and foremost I'm from the private sector. And I'm hoping to bring that voice in particular to the school district because the biggest responsibility that the district has, um, that school board in particular, is balancing that you know over $500 million annual budget prioritizing it, um, balancing it, and making sure that we don't waste the money. 
And you really, really do need a private sector perspective to be on that board. And I'm hoping to bring that. I think the, I think the voters so far um, have been really responsive to that. So, you know, we're swinging for the fences and working really hard, door knocking, making sure we get our, our message out there to people. So folks are going to see a lot more of me coming up real soon. Uh, what is what do you see the position's responsibilities as? So, uh, you know, there's state statute, but what do you see the responsibilities of the position to be? What is most important? Well, the most important role is to one, and I'm a lawyer first and foremost. So, if you go back and just read read the Constitution, you read the state statute. The roles of the school board are very specific. You're balancing the budget, and that is the power of the purse so to speak. It's like Congress. That's why the power of Congress, it's the power to spend the money. And that's where the power really lies. And that's why it's so spread out and fragmented. And that's why the framers set it up that way. Same thing in the Florida Constitution with regards to the legislature. Same thing at the next level down where you have five members, not just one, not the superintendent, but you have five members that spreads out the responsibility of the most important role of the school district, which is to balance and prioritize that massive budget. Because when you and I go and pay our our um, property taxes every year and you go look down the itemized list, the number one category that we spend and put money into of that large bill is the school district. So frankly, it's the budget, making sure that we live within our means and we're, pra- we're protecting the taxpayer's money. That's the, that's the real big role. Now, also statutorily, you work in conjunction with the school superintendent to develop school board policy. And that's why it's important to have educators on that board so that they understand in the development process what what's going to work, what hasn't worked in the past. It's really good to have educators on the board in that regard. We have um, right now out of five members, we have uh, four former educators. So if I go onto the board, it would probably be more like three educators, two from the private sector. And that's a pretty good balance, I think. So the biggest one is to make sure that you, know, you live within your means and you stretch every dollar and you don't waste anything. So to discuss that a little bit further, um, what about you makes you the best candidate for the job? I know you've kind of hit on it a little bit, but just in explicit terms, what makes you the man for the job? Oh, I think probably the fact is the school district in addition to educating our children, is an institution that has 3,500 employees. It has 37,000 students. That's over 70,000 parents. You, these, this is a massive human organization with a lot of money involved. And frankly, you need to have real life experience with dealing with complex, large organizations. My businesses that I, I've been responsible for and operate, we have over 150 pol- employees. We have uh, gross sales well into the millions on all of our locations. You have to have a familiarity with people, politics, internal organizational politics, and the chutzpah to do the things that are difficult, like terminations like saying, hey, listen, I know we've got an endless list of wants, but we only have so much money. So how are we going to prioritize the list of needs versus what we can afford? And sometimes things don't always make the list. And, and you, have, you cannot be a Pollyanna in, in, in business because if you overspend, you go out of business. And the same is true, should be true in government. Now, those backstops of going out of business don't exist in government, but we need it to not be in a deficit. You need just clear-eyed, um, sober as a judge sort of decision making with results-oriented goals when you're making those decisions that come from business experience. And I'm the candidate that offers that. So speaking of Pollyanna, you can't have everything. So what are the the accomplishments or the checkoffs on your to-do list that you want to have done if you are to get a first term in office? So being a trying to be a straight shooter um and that's that's what you have to be in business you have certain types of restrictions on certain types of money that come in they're called categorical so when money comes in from the state it can only be used for certain certain things like capital improvements or personnel and you cannot mix those those pots of money so i say you know, in, an, in a perfect world, I can list out everything that we need to accomplish. And it's going to be difficult because you've got an over $500 million annual budget and 89% of that, the overwhelming lion's share, is just payroll. That's just to pay the 3,500 employees, make sure that they get their benefits. We have payroll tax matching, just like any private employer does. It's ex- the humans are expensive. 
you need the humans because frankly if you have a school district without humans what do you really have some old decaying buildings that's it so the people are the biggest resource but they are so they are also the biggest the biggest expense. So what do we do with that 11% left over? Well, luckily we now have the half cent sales tax money coming in and there's more of it that's coming in than we anticipated and forecast, which is great. We need to make sure that we uh, continue catching up on the deferred maintenance from 30 years uh, of basically just putting band-aids on old buildings. Um, I may have mentioned it before, we're, we're in the top 10% academically, but we're dead last in the average age of our building infrastructure. and because we just didn't collect enough money over the last 30 years to sink it into new buildings and keeping up with the maintenance. And some of it was big stuff, you know, roofs, HVAC, HVAC and Florida, right? Why did that, why did that get, you know, kind of kicked? Well, they're really, you know, to refrigerate an entire building like Crestview High School, it's a massive HVAC system that if, it, if you want to replace it, it's millions of dollars. So where is that just magically going to come from? We have half cent sales tax money. We're going to continue using it to catch up on what's been deferred. We're going to move the ball forward on multi-purpose facilities. We're going to make sure that we're retiring all the portables. There is no reason that portables need to be in this uh, county any longer. And we're going to make sure that we bring as many resources to bear to figure out how we're going to deal with high school capacity in Crestview. And whether that is in the form of expanding the footprint of Crestview High School going vertical and figuring out how to put more kids in the same package there? Or does it look more like um, doing a second facility? Politics is already talking about that right now, but we're going to, either way, we're going to have to move the ball forward because we're already over capacity. So some decisions are going to have to get made. So I'm dedicated to making sure that whatever gets prioritized, that's at the top of the list, figuring out Crest, one of Crestview's biggest hurdles, which is They've got more growth and more people, and they don't have enough school facilities to support them, especially on uh, on the on the secondary uh, education high school front. Can um, we do that uh, without uh, raising property taxes, or is that something we're going to have to look at? Well, it depends on what you prioritize and what you want. I think if you put that at number one, we can afford it, and we have to. Uh, you know, the the trouble we have with touching property taxes in Okaloosa County, in particular, is they are already high. The problem is we have fewer people and fewer and less private property than our adjacent counties to generate that tax revenue for the size of the district and the size of the of the student body that we have. And the reason that, you know, well, well what's missing half the county from a taxing standpoint, which is the federal government owns the majority of the land in Okaloosa County. And that cannot be taxed for school purposes. Yet they do, the, the mission brings in thousands and thousands of people through uh, DOD personnel and their contractors who live in our community and they attend our schools. So it is a double-edged sword. I mean, those people are fantastic. They have uh, stable home lives. They're engaged in their, in their students um, in their student and their excuse me in their children's um, student academic performance. And so we get better academic outcomes, but we're shortchanged kind of like having to fight a boxing match with one arm tied behind your back because from a financial standpoint, we're trying to do everything with half the money. So to make up the difference, we would have to raise taxes a significant amount. And they're just, they're already burdensome on the working class people who make up the electorate of this county. So we're going to have to figure out how to do it another way. And it, a lot of it's just going to be eating the elephant one bite at a time, which is slower, but it is mindful of the fact that you just can't say, oh, let's build everything. Let's do it all at once. And oh, by the way, um, your school portion of the tax bill just doubled. It's just, it's not feasible. It's not protecting, it's not protecting folks and we can do it. We just have to list in priorities what we're going to do and how we're going to do it over time. So um, on the note, you said 89%, right, of the total budget is payroll. Um, what would you do in terms of teacher pay increases remaining competitive against other school districts to keep teachers? Would you, do you see a, a pay rise that's above cost of living in the next couple of years? So we have to work on the bit. One of the, there's two reasons that, there's two reasons that teachers are leaving the profession. One, they're not getting paid enough. And two, they're not getting paid enough to get screamed at for being responsible or the scapegoat for every societal problem we're mad about, left on the left or on the right, to just 
just load up on on these teachers backs so we're going to have to find out a way to pay them more where those efficiencies are going to come from within the district that's going to be one of my first things that we're going to try to figure out we have um we have the ability to reduce our litigation costs we have the ability to go in and once we have more money from different sources either through half cent and or uh state money to uh finance capital improvements then that frees up general revenue budgets for uh, paying teachers more we have to deal with that but also there's these things that may not be within the purview of a school district or a school board member or the board itself to deal with which is parents are harder on teachers than they've ever been um, that is not necessarily the school district's fault that is expectations of the competitive nature the hyper competitive nature of the society we happen to live in most parents don't want to hear uh, that their kids you know falling behind or that their kids not doing what they're supposed to be doing and when the teacher tries to push back and say hey listen these are not being met there's some there's some some negative uh proclivities for some certain parents to, to just attack the teachers and you can't prevent that however what you can do is support and make sure that teachers understand that hey from an administrative from a school district standpoint we have your back and that's not to say that we're going to protect bad teachers. We're not going to listen to parents because that parent parental rights are ex exceptionally important to me and something that we have to prioritize as well. But there's a balance. But you've got to make sure that you have teachers. Otherwise, you know, uh, you don't have a district. So we're going to we're going to work on pay and we're going to work on making sure that the teachers understand that they're supported. The um Walton County and Oak, or Santa Rosa County school districts performed a little bit better on the most recent standardized testing than Okaloosa County. Uh, first question is, is, is that a problem? Like, does this whole standardized testing thing really even matter? And if it does, it does. what would you do to help correct the problem? So standardized testing is a necessary evil of the modern education system. We started shifting over to uh, pay for performance. It was a concept that was put through the legislature in the late 90s by um, by Jeb Bush, and there are lots of good things about pay for performance when it comes to if you have a good school, you get more funding. If you have a bad school, you get less funding. That's a, that's a fundamental check and balance from the business sector that's being applied into uh, schooling. But to solve one problem, the hope is you incentivize uh, schools that are less performing to perform better but a lot of it is always attendant to resources how do you get better teachers if you're in a poor performing school well you, you have to recruit them you have to have money well oh by the way it's a self-fulfilling prophecy if you have a poor performing school you're going to get worse in theory if you get deprived of resources so that's the measuring stick for whether you're a good or a bad school is standardized testing and because of that uh now everyone in the in the in the school business is incentivized to perform as best as they can on standardized testing rather than teaching for learning teaching for understanding and teaching for retention which is you know the way we always did it and unfortunately uh there's some variation in and in, in from year to year and yeah we slipped a little bit but we can make up those differences but there are certain things that you can accomplish as a school board member that will prioritize funding for um, and development of policy to make a difference with regards to making standardized testing less of the end all be all interest of the district. But you have resources that are going to come from the state, which make up a very large percentage of the annual budget that are earmarked to um that are earmarked to the these performances so uh, standardized testing performances and because of that we're not going to get rid of it it would be disingenuous for me as a as a candidate and then as a school board member to tell you that we're going to stop teaching to the test that frankly we need them to perform well on the test however we can't just let that be the only thing and how we're going to cram that in that's going to be tough We've been we've been trying to sort that one out uh, for the last probably fifteen to twenty years because I can see it in our restaurants. Uh, there's a lot of kids that graduate from school and they have retained nothing. They didn't retain anything. They 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 binged to take it in 
they regurgitate it on a test and then they jettison and then nothing's retained. And so you have kids graduating that just don't even have uh, em employable you know, skill sets. They don't have a working knowledge of lots of practical things, which, you know, not necessarily whether or not they can perform well in, you know, Pythagorean's theorem and, and, and basically doing well on a math, on a math portion of a, of a standardized test was going to translate to good working skills, unless you need geometry in your job. But there's lots of stuff that's happening in the district where we're just mostly warehousing kids, testing them, getting the funding and send them out. We have to change that because it's, it's a constant thing that's being brought up to me by, by these uh, parents. They're worried about it. Absolutely. And one of the things that I was not expecting um, that's been brought up to me a lot is about middle school sports. And mm -hmm. I say all that so, because uh, Santa Rosa County recently got rid of middle school sports as a way to save money. Um, and I, got, I had a conversation with the superintendent a couple months ago. Where he told me we will never get rid of middle school sports. And I guess my question to you is middle school sports are, of course, an important thing, but are they so important that you would be willing to raise taxes or come up with alternative revenue streams in order to keep them long term. Well, I'm committed to not getting rid of middle school, middle school sports. They're important. Middle school athletics was where I met many of my best friends. And also middle school sports was when I was at that transitional age from being an elementary school student to trying to be a, a, an early adult when I learned a, a lot of my best habits, which is being where you're supposed to be when you're supposed to be there. That's dependability and accountability. Those translate into high school and college success and, of course, workforce success. I, I figured out how to be tenacious. You know, I swam in middle school and we would do practices nearly every day and they were hard. They were tough. They were early in the morning. Uh, I would jump into a cold pool voluntarily, you know, voluntarily. Um, just because I loved the sport. And in addition to meeting some of the best friends of my life, I, I got a lot of those sort of wherewithal, got to figure it out, push through its skills that I worry I wouldn't have received if I had waited longer after I was growing and forming into an adult, if I had waited for it to be available as a, as a excuse me, as a high school freshman. So now I'm committed to keeping it we're going to figure out a way to to fund it. We're not going to raise taxes to do it, but you've already seen it in some of the schools. Uh, Davidson, um, I believe, uh, Destin Middle School. You know, some of the smaller sports that that usually don't generate a whole lot of money, uh, but they do have loyal. They do have loyal following from from the fan base, their parents. Um, they're starting to charge a little bit small small amount for admission to try to carry the freight at the cost of the programming. So we're going to do that long for a long time before we ever consider getting rid of them, which I just don't think I could ever find a scenario where I would, where I would support that. But middle school sports in particular are very, very important. Gotcha. And uh, switching gears just a little bit um, to some harder policy questions. What standards would you use to determine whether or not to support banning a book or taking a book off the shelves of a library or a classroom in Okaloosa County? Sure. So the law says that we are going to comply with any books that are flagged and we're going to follow the law. It's as simple as that. Now, we're going to use age appropriateness standards when applying those rules. That's what the law says we need to do and that's what I'm interested in doing as well. If there's a if there is a book that is flagged, we're going to review it. Um can't guarantee that it'll be something that gets ultimately removed, but it's going to be on a case by case, fact by fact um scenario. And I'm not scared of looking at, at at the books, but we're going to make sure age appropriate stuff is um available for kids, but um we're not we're we're not going to let anything bad get through. Uh uh Going to the, I guess, the guts of school board policy, um, one of the policies that I've noticed just as a journalist is that when employees are suspended or terminated, they're referred to in board agendas by their, by their uh, employee ID as opposed to names. Do you favor that practice and uh, why or why not? So here's the trouble. It depends on, a case, again, going back to the legal issue. One, one of the biggest frustrations parents come to me and talk about is they go, so-and-so at this school got suspended, and they're not telling us anything. Well, there's a reason that you're not told anything, because, frankly, due process and privacy is 
uh, paramount to be protected because allegations are allegations until they're substantiated through investigation and then through in, in the normal process of a, of a criminal analysis, then you have a trial and then you have a conviction. That's why there's a presumption of innocence until proven guilty because in human society, and ours is no exception, the court of public opinion wants to draw and quarter everybody first and foremost, as soon as the allegation is out there. And what if it is false? What if it is not accurate? And that's why until there is an investigation, a fact gathering um, uh, process, that we don't say anything uh, to the public until we have more to say. Now, that is uh, important to maintain. I support that. Um, but after that point, if you are found to have done something wrong and you're being terminated, you know, yeah, that's only an employee number, only a, uh, only some sort of cryptic reference to why somebody's being fired. If the law says we have to do that, I'm not familiar with it. And more so, it feels as though that the district would be doing that simply to avoid the public circus that could follow the termination of someone. Now, I'm not interested in, frankly, I, I'm pro-transparency, and if people are upset and someone has been terminated because of for cause, you know, just trying to avoid some sort of public review and oversight of that process by using employee ID numbers or something like that, you know, unless it's required by the law, I'm I'm not scared of transparency and open government. Let's let's send it out there. People want to know, and they have at that point the right to know without there being undue damage to the uh, to the institution or, or the people who have been let go, because if you did your investigation and they're being let go, then that's that. Um, so, uh, so for everybody so at home, we uh, home, just had some yeah, technical difficulties. It's all good. Uh, that's why you're seeing my head jump like this immediately uh, in the middle of an interview. So we'll get back to our final question. Our final question being um, that there, there are a lot of charge symbols in our culture just generally. Um, and some of those, um, so for example, pride flags or Confederate flags or uh, any sort of symbols that have charge meaning behind them. There's been a big discussion about whether or not these symbols should be allowed in schools. And my question to you is, as, as a school board member, do you support uh, allowing those kinds of symbols in schools? And then why or why not? And then finally, as a school board member, what would you do to enforce policy or create policy that would achieve your objective? So that is one of the most complicated questions to answer because it's the intersection of First Amendment rights. It's the intersection of politics and whether or not they are going to be present in schools. And it's also the intersection of how many distractions can we have within the schools to that could interfere with the learning environment. And so there is a whole host of constitutional law that has dealt with uh, the charged political environments and then how it ends up permeating schools uh, since the 1970s. The Vietnam War era generated a ton of uh, Supreme Court cases trying to construe how much of a student's uh, First Amendment rights to free speech and free expression are sort of shed or left at the schoolhouse gate when they go inside. And so there are um, restrictions on how much political discourse can occur from any student uh, during this during class time because um, political discourse is distracting and it can interfere with the learning process and so long as quiet symbols are not uh, distracting they are somewhat allowed and I think that was a court I think that was a uh, that was a case with regards to somebody in the Vietnam War there was a student that was wearing an armband and then there was a there was another case where a student was interrupting class to protest the Vietnam War, and that was not allowed. And so it's a very, very fraught area to try to regulate people's free expression. Now, it bumps up into the issue of how much uh, expression can we allow versus distraction. And I can't tell you sitting here today, it's a case by case basis. You know, uh, folks showing up with the Confederate flag. If it's if it's during a history course and 
you know, even then it's, it's so divisive. It's so distracting. I can't see where most of these symbols and a lot of this discourse has any place in the learning environment um, without there being repercussions and, and, and fallback uh, or blowback, excuse me, on the ability for these kids to learn and for these teachers to teach. So we need to be mindful of whatever we're going to regulate that we are doing so from a, from a, from a place that, hey, listen, political discourse can and should happen so long as it's in the right areas without interfering with the main primary directive and goal of the school district, which is teaching. Um, you know, talking about the Confederacy during history class, that's appropriate. Talking about, um, you know, uh, gay pride symbols and, and gay folks during history when we talk about some of the progress that was made in the 1960s and 70s with regards to civil rights within the LGBTQ community in a history course, it's appropriate. Um, but to try to turn the schools inside out for certain students that just want to make it a political soapbox, you know, we can't do that. We have to be educating these students. And as much of the turmoil of modern politics that can be kept out of schools, that's what the direction we need to go in. And that's what I support. It's going to be difficult. I don't have, I don't have a, a, a golden bullet, um, sort of, sort of stumping point that could tell you this is the way to, to solve it, but we need to be leaning towards uh, calming down things in the school and keeping folks focused on learning rather than um, just our schools. So you're telling me you can't solve it in a 15 second soundbite? I can't. I wish I could. But I so I've asked you a ton of questions and uh, I think I should give you some time on the floor to talk about what either more about yourself or about this race or about what you see more generally. Is there anything that people watching this need to know about Parker or about his policy thoughts or anything in general? Yeah, I, I really, really do deeply care about the students in our district. I'm a pro I'm a product of the Okaloosa County school system. I've been successful completely attributable to the education that I received, the mentors I had and, and, and the teachers that led me along this process in my life. It was the foundation for everything. I did well in college and in law school from that foundation. And I want to serve in an effort to make sure that the students presently today get the same opportunities that I did. Um, there are more complex and difficult problems to solve today than there were in the past. But you need young, energetic private sector voices that are going to say, hey, listen, I don't care what it takes. I'll lay down in traffic for these kids to fight for them, make sure that they've got a brighter future ahead of them. Because at the end of the day, all of us are simply stewards of our community. And this is my time to serve. You're at an age where you're serving. And that's sort of the process. We got we to gotta step up and look after everything because there is a next crop of, of folks that need us to look after them just in the same that the that the older generation looked after us and so in in that role i cannot wait to get in there Perfect. well parker destin thank you so much for joining us today and being a part of this if you want more information about all the candidates midbaynews.com slash elections is the place to go we have full candidate bios more videos like this and Everything else you'd ever want to know in one place so you don't have to go look for it yourself. Trust me, it took me forever to find it. Uh, that's <laughs> midbaynews.com slash elections. All right. So Thanks I'm for having me, Chris.